Hi everyone, uh, based on my last video about the gap in the early church of nobody in the first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation are paying much attention to Paul's writings other than the Marcionites, which believe Paul's the only apostle, Jesus is not a Messiah, he's God from birth, and they're off on their own tangent, and uh, most Christians regard them as not even Christian because they, of course, they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. So anyway, the remarkable thing is one of the writers among those who do not pay much attention to Paul is a guy named Justin Martin, Martyr. And uh, I mentioned him in the last video, and I said he never cites Paul. So I wanted to give you that backup information, and you'll see it's in multiple sources here on our, on our uh, webpage. This is called the Early Church Views of uh, Paul, actually. Uh, so Justin Martin is one of the most prolific writers in the early church whose writings have come down to us. Yet, quote, Justin, martyr, 103 to 165 AD, took no notice of Paul. This is an Encyclopedia Biblica. I'm gonna, this is the original Encyclopedia uh, Biblica. I don't know if you can see that up here. I highlight it, maybe you can see it. So it's now in archive.org. And you, the way I found it is I just simply searched for uh, Justin, the word uh, Justin in here. And I'm going to do it again. Justin took, hold on. Oops. I don't know if you can see this. Okay, so, so here it is. Justin took no notice of Paul. And then... Uh, he, this does mention in the next breath, Tertullian. Uh, I know he's talking about Tertullian because it's this uh, Latin expression, hereticorum apostolus, uh, was on his lips. So Tertullian called Paul the apostle of the heretics, which was a derogatory term. I've gone through that <laughs> a couple hundred times, I think, so far. Uh, there's no doubt that's what he said, and he meant it scornfully. It's, in fact, uh, this uh, the biblical... Um, Encyclopedia Biblica says that's how it is. you should understand it. It was a scornful remark by Tertullian. So you not only have what I showed you, Tertullian endorsing the law, it contrary, you know, in his battle with Marcion, who's taking the Paul position, and Tertullian, a major leader of the early church in the two, 205 period, our leading voice of, of what you would call orthodoxy at the time, he's saying simultaneously, he refers to Paul scornfully as the Heritor Quorum Apostolos, but the point we're making here at the moment is Justin took no notice of Paul. I mean, in all these writings, very prolific writer, but never mentioning Paul. Now, let's see if there's an explanation offered for that. So we will go back here. So that's what it said initially, and you, I found it in the backup, the archive.org uh, webpage. And then uh, the next is from... Uh, John Romanidides, Justin Martyr and the Fourth Gospel, Greek Orthodox Theological Review, 1958, Volume 4 at 115. He says, in Justin, quote, Paul is never quoted directly. Never quoted directly. So all the works, all the writings, all the epistles, ignored. He ignores them 100%. In Canon, the article Canon in the Encyclopedia Britannica in 1903, volume 5 at page 8, it relates as to Justin Martin, quote, Paul's epistles are never mentioned, never mentioned, although he doubtless knew of them. Having little sympathy with Paulinism, he attached his belief to the primitive apostles. The epistles to the Hebrews and Acts he treated in the same way as the Pauline writings. So basically, he ignored the epistle to the Hebrews and the book of Acts. Let's see what else is here. Incidentally, the Encyclopedia Britannica points out that as to the other items of canon, it is pretty clear he, that is Justin, relied on the Matthew Gospel version in Hebrew. And that's what I believe is also called the Memoirs of the Apostles that Jerome said was translated into Greek. Only the Greek version was canonized, not the original Hebrew version. So that's just a fortuity of history. The canon was formed by people generations well after the Apostles. The only thing they uh, adhered to was the Hebrew Matthew. And just so you know, their plan was by keeping a master copy under lock and key, but you know, for people could have access to a responsible in Caesarea at a library, apparently in a person's home. By doing that, they could avoid anyone corrupting it 
They, they would know the people coming in could have good credentials. Maybe they were a famous translator like Theodosian was from Hebrew to Greek. They, somebody, they, tr they let only people they thought they could trust in to, to inspect it. They let Jerome look at it. And this is many generations later. Three, it's, uh, I think it's uh, 392. He goes and inspects the Hebrew Matthew and he makes the translation into Latin and Greek, and then he puts it in his commentary on the book of Matthew, he, and he treats it as, as if it is the original, just so we're clear. All right, so the Encyclopedia Britannica mentions um, there was the Matthew Gospel in Hebrew, and that's the only thing that Justin wanted to look at. So you had a major, major leading voice. He must have gone and gotten a copy. And just so we know, he's from Syria. He was born in Syria, and then he moves to Rome in the middle of his life. And then I could go on here. Only the Greek was canonized, not the original Hebrew. That's for, just fortuity. The encyclopedia relates, it is pretty certain that he relied upon an extra canonical gospel, perhaps the so-called gospel to the Hebrews. Now, see, to me, that's a prejudicial statement. The canon was the Hebrew gospel. These are the people who, the people who were in charge of the canon were the 12. That's what they're saying. The Hebrew gospel of Matthew, that's canon. However, you define canon, you know, in, in, in pagan lands or in, Gentile dominated denominations somewhere else. This is what the original church was insisting upon is this Matthew that we've protected under, I don't want to say lock and key, but, but basically protected it in Caesarea. We've granted access to people who are responsible, but that's all. And there's copies circulating of that and so on. And that's all they cared about. Um, and then it says here the apocalypse, that's John's revelation, 1 Peter and 1 John, he esteemed highly. So Justin is looking at the book of Revelation, 1 Peter, not 2 Peter, and 1 John, and those he esteemed highly. So that's something to consider. Why would he be focused only on those books and therefore not paying attention to 2 Peter, not paying attention to 2 John, 3 John? Just something to think about. Cosgrove similarly states, quote, and this is in a work, let's just look at the work first. Charles Cosgrove, Justin Martyr, and the Emerging Christian Canon in Vigilai Christiani, 36, 1982, pages 209 to 32. And it was excerpted at this JSTOR link. So if you click the link there at the webpage, you can look it up yourself. Let's see what he says. Isidore Frank in his Der Sinn Canon Bildung, 1971, argues that the memoirs of the apostles, and I've talked to this about, about this earlier, is the Hebrew Matthew did actually begin in his first few chapters, of course, according to Michaelis, uh, by referring to the, the 12 apostles were the voice speaking, saying, this is our recollections, this is what we remember, and so on. So this is the way it started. And, and then it switches to first person of Matthew, according to Michaelis, in, in his reading of Epiphanius. And then by the end of the book of Matthew, he's speaking in the third person. This is what Michaelis said that Epiphanius observed in the version he was looking at in the late 300s. And to me, that makes perfect sense that you would call it the memoirs of the apostles, because when you pick it up, the first few chapters don't purport to be writing on behalf of Matthew. It's more, um, more the gospel of the apostles, but Matthew's the major voice through by the end of it. Okay. Uh, argues that the memoirs of the apostles are regarded by Justin and his community as of einer Stuf with the Old Testament. So basically on the same level as the Old Testament. So this is this would be your inspired canon, not your secondary canon, not your good reading list. This is the inspired word of God. So according to Frank, Justin definitely includes the three synoptic gospels within his designation of memoirs, but not John or Paul. Now well, that's interesting. He doesn't include John. Justin represents a reversal of the trend in the second century church of regarding apostolic writings as or letters as canon. So that raises an interesting question. People ask me all the time, you know, do you really believe the book John is from John? Well, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll just say this is if he didn't accept it, he may have had a good reason. OK, but on the other hand, he is living. He, he, we we got to look at his date. Of, he's born in 103. The book of John isn't written until 96. So when he is born, it's, uh, let's see, six, seven, seven years after it's written, he's born. So he may not trust it 
or have, you know, maybe he's the kind of guy who wants to personally verify something. So there could be a reason that because he's so, he's born late in time, yet he's able to verify other things. He maybe hasn't verified the Book of John yet. So that could be an explanation. And maybe the Book of John took time to be penetrating and, and be accepted. You never know. So, you know, I ha I've never done research on the background of the Book of John. So I don't really, I'd be speculating if I told you why he doesn't include it. Uh, or doesn't, uh, does he not include it? Is that what they're saying? It, he definitely includes the three synoptic gospels within his designation of memoirs, but not John or Paul. Well, that doesn't mean he never discusses John. So we have to find out if he does ever discuss John. I'll look into that. But he never, never quotes Paul. And that's so that's so telling that Paul has no influence on the, on this major voice. Again, from Syria, he moves to Rome. This person has no interest in anything Paul has to say. This is fundamentally shocking if you look at all the writings of Justin. All right. Um, then it says, when Justin speaks of the apostles operating post-resurrection, Justin is clear that God sent 12, not 13, which means he implicitly ignores Paul. This is in Justin's first apology chapter or book. What is that? Uh, is that, f I think it's 49. You take the X and you subtract it from the L and you get 49. Okay, at 47. Proof this may be deliberate is that Justin later in the same first apology denies Christians believe in predestination and fatal destiny because, quote, the prophetic spirit instructed us in the doctrine of free will by Moses, who introduces God speaking to man, behold, good and evil is before you, choose the good, close quote. First apology, LVI, so that would be 56, quoting Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 and 19. And we give a link to that at page 51. So those are doctrines of Paul, basically, predestination. And they're not the doctrines of Jesus Christ. They're not the doctrines of anybody but Paul. And uh, just so you know, the Pharisees were big into predestination. And, uh, and that's what we get from both the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, um, the writings of uh, Josephus. And quite importantly, based upon Justin's many work, many books, one may wonder if Paul's epistles were truly circulating among leaders of the church, as Justin clearly was. Yes, he's a church leader. For Edwin Johnson in 1887 notes, his, Justin Martyr, Chirk, Chirka, or around 100 to 165 Christian era, silence about Paul. So his silence about Paul when he had every reason to cite him in his anti judaistic reasoning. So he apparently didn't like certain Judaizing. So this is interesting. I'd like to see what that was about. Is a silence that speaks a void that no iteration of unattested statements, no nebulous declamation can ever fill. I mean, he's saying this is a profound fact that, that he has all these numerous writings and he never he never quotes Paul, doesn't discuss him. He's like he's a non he's a non person, a non entity. And this in, is in Edwin Johnson's book. He's a uh, he's a English historian. He's not a per se Christian, so I would call him an outsider looking in. He just is an observer. At least that's how I view him, and I think a fair minded person. So I've read his book quite a bit, um, or quite a big section of his book because he writes a lot about. Uh, Tertullian and uh, the book against Marcion. So uh, he was uh, he was born in 1842, died in 1901. Antigua Matter, a study of Christian origins, London, Trubner and Company, Ludgate Hill, 1887 and 35. I actually recommend people look at that book because again, you get a little, sometimes when you read Christian material, you get such a slanted view that you can't see the whole big picture. And he's not that way. He's just telling you what the people say, what he interprets them to say. He, you know, basically a common sense reading of things instead of trying to, uh, the, whatever. So um, let's keep going on here. Uh, oh, oh, this this was something that was shocking to me too. I forgot. Papias, a disciple of Apostle John from 130 AD, two never once quoted uh, Paul. Let me let me put this on pause for a minute. Okay, so this is actually a link to uh, my book here. And uh, so I have a remark about Papias. So Papias, uh, 
says right here, Papias, Bishop of Heropolis, 130 AD, quote, do not contain any, quote, his works do not contain any quotation from Paul, end of quote, even while quoting John's Gospel 14, colon 2, and 1 Peter, 1 Peter. Okay, and if we go down to footnote 4, this is, this is in an article, Papias, by the Catholic Encyclopedia, so they thought that was quite unusual. My recollection is Papias is nowhere as numerous as um, as Justin Martyr, but clearly he wrote some things. And he, Papias is just so you know, for the record, he he claims in his writings that he was the one who transmitted or translated John's Gospel. So he is the recipient. He's sitting there translating John's Gospel, or or excuse me, taking it from John verbatim and then writing it down in in perfect Greek. And by the way, if you were Justin Martyr, Martin, Martyr, and let's say you knew some Greek, you, everybody can see who knows Greek, you, reading the book of Revelation versus the book of John, uh, John they're like radically different. One's, one's very rough Greek, one is very polished Greek. So you know, whoever it is, it's not the same person who did each book. So that raises your cackle right away. But what, what that means is Papias he wants it to read excellent. He's not going to, he's not going to take this stuff from John and make it read as rough like it did when whoever helped John do the book of Revelation. He's going to make it smoothed out and clean and good Greek. And maybe that's what people uh, notice. And maybe that's what put jo Justin Martyr on guard. You know, the, hey, I'd have to know why it reads so differently in Greek. I mean, you're, re you're definitely reading two different people writing. And that's the influence of Papias. And I don't think it takes away inspiration, by the way. Uh, God can God can get a, a helper to, to the Apostle John, and you can do a, a better job than you would otherwise maybe writing in your own, your own effort to write Greek, which is not your native language. All right, so, uh, so that just shows you there's more than one person than just Justin Martyr. But Papias is nowhere near the same level of uh, amounts of material to consider. We're talking like, huge amounts of volume of work with not, no mention of Paul. It's deliberate. It's not It's not a mistake. Uh, he never refers to him at all. And compare that to our modern churches. You know, I, 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 I'm just going to interject again. I've done, I sat there in monitor churches for years. Every time I go to church, I always keep a ch chart of how many times Jesus is cited and how many times Paul is cited. And it's always, always consistently over time, 13 Paul, one for Jesus in every church denomination doesn't matter whether it's presbyterian baptist uh any any protestant denomina denomination you know non non-denominational <laughs> denominations they all have the same pattern it's just it's just sickness and actually what's weird is even when they do a passage of jesus from matthew or luke uh, unless they're going verse by verse it literally, it still comes out 13 to 1. I don't know how they do that. The, 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 you're actually expositing on a passage of Jesus, and it comes out all 13 to 1 for Paul. Okay, so I'm going to stop it again, and we're going to go back. I also want to point out something that people should really realize. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I, I guess I was, this is an article. I was taking this uh, remark about Justin Martin, Martin out of an article on what was the early church view of Paul. And I think the, one of the shocking things that maybe people never think about is, did Luke ever know of any of Paul's letters? And the answer is clearly not. Clearly not. And I'll tell you why in a minute. So let's just go through this for a minute. The fact Luke's Acts and Gospels show virtually no knowledge of Paul's epistles and says nothing in either to help their acceptance was first exposed by theologian F.C. Bauer. Recently, Hengel and Schwimmer, in a book called Paul Between Antioch and Damascus, at page 322, says, quote, Since F.C. Bauer and his pupils, there has been no evidence that knowledge of Paul's letters by Luke can be demonstrated. Not a single one. What you can actually prove from Luke is that he doesn't know. He has no idea that Paul teaches contrary to what he's saying in front of Paul, in front of Luke. I, I have what I want to show you uh, that proves that Luke doesn't know about Paul. Uh, but first, I'm going to read you the scholars, how they talk about it. Further, no use was made by them. Well, hold on. Let me go back here. The letters. There, No use was made of Paul's letters by anyone else until 100 AD, beginning with Clement. 
Okay, so this is the first reference to Paul is 100 AD. Now he's he's died around 64 AD. So this is 36 years later, the first mention. Hengel and Schremer add, quote, when Luke was writing, Paul's letters may have been in the archives of one community or another. The use of them begins only with 1 Clement or shortly after 100 CE. They will have been collected and edited around this time while Luke wrote, quote, 20 years earlier. And that's true. Luke wrote much earlier. But what is shocking to consider is Luke is traveling with Paul. Does not Paul carry any of the letters? His very first letter was written in 47 AD to the Galatians. And yet he's he's with Luke well after that time. That's been written. And it's possible and probable that 1 Corinthians has also been written by the time he's, he's uh, Luke is with Paul visiting him. And he starts visiting him in Acts chapter 16. And it would seem probable that between the time of Acts 16 and when Luke is basically going with Paul to Rome by the time to wait for the appeal. And, and basically then when at Rome, Luke is creating the book of Luke and the book of, of um, Acts in their final form to deliver to Theophilus at Rome. The, the uh, assistant judge to Nero is the most likely person who he is, according to the book by Mr. Malk. He clearly should be, you would think he's had some interface by this point in time before he's finished Acts with uh, the, some of the writings of Paul. So, he, he, so, but the scholars are saying he, he probably didn't have access for most of the time, or maybe none at all. And, but it's hard to imagine that Paul can be in such intimate contact with someone and not share his, his letters if he's so, such a famous person. But more importantly, Paul never shares his doctrines with Luke. And here's what, this is even, this is clearly gets back to why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10 that he, he behaves like the person he's with. He doesn't show who he really is. And he's, he's shameless about it. He's not hiding. In fact, he does this. He'll be a Jew around Jew. He'll be a, a non-Jew around non-Jews. So if someone doesn't believe in the law, he'll be as one who doesn't have the law. If if someone thinks the law applies, I'll behave as one who's a follower of the law. I'll be all things to all people for, you know, uh, you know, if I, basically he says people pleasing is necessary to advance his gospel. Okay. So you can read him 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10. And here's why you can tell I have these notes here. Luke knows only a Paul who obeys the law when requested by James in Acts 21. So in Acts 21, Luke records, and he's there apparently. He's right there watching. And and James, the bishop of Jerusalem, says, look, Paul, I've heard that people think you're guilty of apostasia. Never translated so that you people in the pews can hear what the word was. They change it to, you, you know, that you are, um, you're not following the customs of the Jews. That's not what it says. It's the word apostasy. We all know what it is. Just tell, we're adults. We can hear the word, but they don't want you to hear the word. So anyway, back to the story. So uh, James asks Paul in front of Luke, apparently, I've heard, heard rumors that you're guilty of apostasy, that you're teaching that even Jews do not have to circumcise their children. Now, Paul, I know you wouldn't do that. So I want you to sh prove to all the others who are spreading these rumors about you that you do something publicly so that you can put to rest all of these accusations. I'm, I'm kind of embellishing here. So this is not a verbatim quote, but it's the intention of this passage. And then I want you to go take these several men to go do the ritual of the Nazarite vow under Numbers chapter six of the Torah. And that will show everyone that you, all these statements about you being anti-Torah are not true. Now, were they true? Oh, absolutely. In fact, even as to circumcising Jews, why? Because Paul said what? There is no more Jew or Gentile in Christ. Therefore, there is no more Jew. There is no more need for circumcision because it only applies to the people who are Jewish. Since there is no more Jew, there is no more principle of the, co the Abrahamic covenant. It is dissipated because if you have no more Jew, you have no more. <laughs> if you have no more Jew, you have no more people who are subject to the 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 Abrahamic covenant. I know Paul takes talks inconsistent with that. You know, in in Galatians, he'll say that there uh, the, the the Abrahamic covenant could not have been done away by the Sinai covenant, and therefore the Sinai covenant is invalid. Just so you know, that's in Galatians chapter two. He invalidates the Sinai covenant multiple times in the book of Galatians. One, it's 
it can't be brought. You can't bring the Sinai Ten Commandment covenant because uh, that that would breach the covenant with Abraham, and and you can't do that. God God cannot do that, and and the proof is because you can't do it in human contracts. You can't. God couldn't do it, and that's not true in human contracts, by the way. But but this is what he said, and then he says later the angels gave the law. So he he cuts down the law completely in the book of Galatians, and um, so could now in light of what I just told you. Now listen to the next two things. Could Luke possibly have known of that very first work of Paul, the book of Galatians 40, 70 D, the very first writing he wrote when he, when he allows him to say this, he, Paul affirms in Acts 24 verse 14 before Felix and its testimony, this is a court judge. He's the judge and the ruler. And Paul affirms that he believes in quote, all points according to the law, all points according to the law. Now you, you, the, in the, the hint or the suggestion to the listener is that I believe in all the law. And you're not supposed to think that he's using the words all points according to somehow as a qualifier, as somehow as an escape mechanism from having believe from affirming all the law. He appears to be affirming all the law, but his words have some mealy mouth to them, all points according to the law. So that does suggest you and I know that he doesn't agree with the law. He doesn't believe the law is valid. It's, they're, they're given by angels. They are no gods. They're weak and beggarly elements. He insults everything about the law in Galatians 2, 3, and 4. And he says the, the Sinai covenant wasn't even allowed to be brought by God because you're not allowed to abrogate a prior covenant that was salvation by faith alone and, and no laws, no laws at all, just faith and a promise by God to give a child an old age to Abraham. That's all he had to do. No, no, no law obedience, just simply a... Uh, he just had to believe that a gift God was giving him was true. It was going to truly happen, and that would save him. And then all people would see, equally be saved by believing just facts about God that have nothing to do with right, implying any duty to obey God. And that's that's Paul's doctrine. You can't take it away from him. That's Romans 4, verses 3 to 4. So my, but my point is Luke could not possibly have known anything about Paul's doctrines because you, you couldn't, you couldn't in good faith write it the way he wrote it because that would make Luke look like he's trying to deceive us. But what I really think is happening is he's quoting Paul exactly word for word. He doesn't know why Paul's talking the way he is. He doesn't know why, why he's saying all points according to the law. Is that meant to be, give you an escape somehow that you know if it's if i don't believe something is if something in the law is not according to the law it has points maybe that are not consistent with the law that i think are you know should be removed from the law i mean who knows what he really is means in his heart but luke is recording it and makes us the listener and the listeners at that time are, are trying to be reassured that paul is law obedient because that's what's the issue at trial are you were you telling your companion Trophimus not to be circumcised and he enters the temple and defiles the temple? This is all going on in Acts 22 to 26. And of course, your your pastors never explained to you that Paul's friend goes into the temple and defiles it in an uncircumcised state. No, you, you're never supposed to know any of this stuff because you're not supposed to ever read past a certain point and you're never going to be told why Paul's on trial. And you're, you're never even told this book is, is about Paul being put on trial at the end of the book. So there's so many things that Christians are left in the dark about the book of Acts. And, and that's, th there's no mistake why they're doing it. And, uh, but anyway, my point is this, Luke does not know of Paul's own writings and he's writing 45 years before Justin. But by the time of Justin, uh, we have Clement by 100 C CE. So this is three years before Justin is born. The first letters are emerging. Clement has them. Clement is, lives at Rome. Justin lives at Rome. Now he does at that time. Now, excuse me. Well, after he's born, he's going to move to Rome. So he, he will be exposed. If he wanted to find out about Paul's writings, he will find them there in Rome if he wants to, because Clement found them. But he doesn't use them. He never pays any attention to them. I just want to show you more, another proof that Paul did not disclose who he really was to Luke is when in Acts 26, 20, he affirms all the law in this particular passage. But to me, the most shocking thing he says, I put in quotes here. Do you see here? I've highlighted this. Paul does this. He, Paul is giving testimony before Agrippa. And he says, so I say, there's no way Luke could know 
know the Paul's writings because he could never let let this be put in a book. Even even to the Rome Roman judge, you'd have to wonder if he would put this in there because it's such such uh, such an incon there's inconsistency between Paul's writings and Galatians to the Galatians. He says uh, Paul says I, I teach a gospel uh, basically of works worthy of repentance. So according to this answer. Paul is teaching salvation by works worthy of repentance, which is Jesus' message. And so Luke has no idea that this is inconsistent with anything. And this sounds exactly like Jesus. This is Jesus' message. It's the John the Baptist message. It's the same message. <laughs> and Paul is trying to say, I'm in the same league with them. I'm not creating a new religion. And that was the whole point. And that's what Luke was trying to prove because these this book of Acts is being used as a legal brief and that's who Theophilus is. He's a judge. Mr. Malk did a very excellent book on this. We do a whole whole series on this on the web on the YouTube channel. So basically, he does not know that Paul teaches contrary to this. That not only that you're saved by faith, not works. That that trying to do works, be justified by obeying God's law in any way, repent by following God's law, actually damns you and severs you from Christ. If you try to get circumcised now you've got you have severed yourself from christ if you want to obey the weak and beggarly elements by observing days and weeks and months basically the sabbath and the holidays he says you know you're in bondage you're you've you you're falling into bondage again you know why would you want to do that and obey those who are no gods the ten commandments are given by the angels didn't did you not hear what i said that's what paul is saying in this letter Galatians 3 and 4. Please read it, everybody. Every Paulinist must read those chapters because you yourselves will go, this is this is too much. I didn't read this. I've never focused on it. It's over-the-top crazy talk, crazier talk than you can imagine. And that's what I bet you Justin knew. So when you when you start early and you get the truth fast, why would you ever, you would never refer to someone who you yourself can see as an apostate on the face of it. He's contrary to God's word, God's law, whatever he's saying has no value because he's a, an apostate. And that's exactly what the church found out about him. Okay. So I'm going to leave it there. Let me just see here. Yeah. There's other, other books that reflect the, the early period before Constantine is that's, this is why I pull this all out. The, the movement in favor of Paul was non-existent among Christians. It was very in, in, in motion with the people who are pagans, who are anti-Christians, the Marcionites. They believe Jesus is, is God, was create is God come to earth. He looks human, but he really isn't a human being. And what did John the John of the, of the gospel, uh, excuse me, Apostle John, what did he say in his epistles? twice in, in John 1 and in John 2, he said the, the Antichrist will teach you that Jesus did not come in true human flesh. This is precisely the gospel of Marcion, that Jesus was God in heaven. He came to earth. He, um, and, and, and basically he was not the Messiah. And that, that's, you know, all the Christians who believe he was the Messiah have a wrong idea. And his total job was to basically end up being a, a channel himself from heaven to Paul, who never quotes him. And because he, Paul says, I can't, this is in 2 Corinthians 12, there was a man who went to third heaven and he means himself. And, and it was illicit for him to tell anything he heard there from, from God and, Jesus. So, you know, that's his explanation why he never quotes Jesus. He was told it's illegal. It's illicit, actually, is how it sounds in Greek. So it's impermissible to actually quote Jesus. And does that sound like the true Jesus, everybody? No, it's not the true Jesus. It's not, he, he's had an experience with something he doesn't understand is not on the side of good. <laughs> it's on some other side. It's not on the side of good. So you know where I'm going with that. All right, so this is this is the bottom line: is Paul has no support in the early church, none, and his writings don't even come into existence till around 100. There's nobody paying any attention. So imagine he's dead in 64 AD; he's gone, his whole influence is gone. His writings are not causing anyone to follow him at all, and somehow Marcion, around around 100 to 140, he dies. I think Marcion dies in 140. So in that period of time, he finds these writings of Paul and he gets so excited, he starts pushing these things and he comes up with this radical idea that Jesus is God, 
Jesus uh, uh, is not the Messiah, and uh, and Paul's the only apostle, and the twelve are serving uh, the bad God Yahweh. He's a mean, mean God. He has rules. The good God of uh, uh, of the Father. He forgives us of all sins. We don't even have to repent. We're all forgiven. We're all going to heaven. We just have to like. I don't. I don't know how he how he got recruited people, but people. This became a, a a religious force that was becoming equal in numbers, almost to the Christian movement at one point. <laughs> the people, everybody's following Paul, and nobody's following Jesus anymore. And so, but anyway, the church fought back. Tertullian fought back, and if it weren't if it weren't for Tertullian's re, debunking of Paul in the book of uh, called Against Marcion, he debunked him as an apostle and said, hey, there's no proof that he's an apostle. Look at anything. Did Jesus ever call him an apostle? No. If you technically look at the book of Acts, Jesus never calls Paul an apostle. And that's what Mar uh, Tertullian does. He says, you have, so, so Marcion, you have no basis for what you're saying. And, and uh, I'm, con I'm making you have to prove. I don't, I don't have to prove whether Paul's an apostle or not. I have to make you prove him. And you can't prove he's an apostle. And so he debunks him. So, uh, but that's a complicated thing, and I have other videos on it, but that's how, that's how the church beat away Marcin in the end, is Paul was invalidated in this wonderful book by Tertullian. It's a monument to world history. It's a book that changed world history because Marcion, Marcionism was about to take over Christianity until he said, no, he's not an apostle. He's an apostle of the heretics. He's not an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's basically the the end of the book. And he struggled because he doesn't get to that point until like he starts beginning get, getting into book three out of five books. And by, by the time he gets to book five, though, he slams it, slams the case closed. All right. Anyway, so uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff we all have to learn to be able to explain this to people who have never been exposed to this. And so it's all on our web website. It's we have lots of videos. It's easier to learn that way, I think, frankly. And I put I put up there the web pages to, you know, we're looking at them and and hopefully this will help you to uh, explain this to others. And if you are on the fence, this, just listening to this, maybe you'll get a better idea of what you're up against. If you think you want to follow Paul and not Jesus, it's a big, big difference. And it's like in the earliest church, had no following for Paul. He, he went into oblivion, and that's what I tell people. He went into a, a oblivion hole, and if it weren't for the fact that he was abrogating Sabbath, and Constantine wanted that to be the policy of the church. He wanted people to go to church on Sunday to worship his god, Saul, Invictus, the god of the sun. If it weren't for that, Paul would have never, never come out of the ashes, ash heap of history. And if for some reason you think that the fact that the book of Acts focuses a lot on Paul, this is around 55 to 60 AD, the answer is no. That book of Acts has been proven to be written as a brief uh, for Theophilus, the most excellent Theophilus. He's been sent this as a brief for a pending appeal that is pending at the end of the book of Acts. Paul is in Rome waiting an appeal in front of Nero, and Theophilus is the assistant magistrate judge, and that's all the book of Acts is about. It was not intended for Christians. It's not intended to promote Paul to us at all. And in fact, if you read it very carefully, you would see it has a lot of things that are only designed to make Paul seem appealing to pagans. So, for example, when Paul is endorsed by the Python priestess in Acts 16, 16, 16, that's something that would be very impressive to pagans, but be absolutely repulsive to Christians. Same thing when Paul on Mars Hill in Acts 17 says uh, to the Stoic philosophers who are hearing him in a little mini trial, Paul says, God does not dwell in temples made of human hands. And that is totally contrary biblically, right? Uh, God was at that time dwelling in the temple at uh, Jerusalem, which Jesus himself uses the very same words uh, to say God dwelt at the temple made of hands when Jesus was talking about those who swear by the temple made by where God dwells in a temple made of human hands. So Jesus contradicts Paul, but that's not the point. The point is Paul's saying something that will be very appealing to the Stoic pagans because their gods do not live in, pay, in the temples. They don't live there. They live always at Mount Olympus, and they visit their temples to eat their sacrificial meats. So anyway, it very clearly, the book of Acts is not meant for Christians. It was not prom given to us to promote it, promote him to us. It was given solely to be for Theophilus Judge. 
and to win an appeal when Christianity would suffer a potential delegitimization, delegalization, because we were operating under Judaism's protection. And if we were found to be rebellious against Judaism, we could be outlawed and we could no longer preach, teach, or assemble. That's how Rome worked with religions that were not legal. And we would have been in that category. If you're interested in reading up on this, we have eight episodes on the Luke Acts uh, being uh, written for to win an appeal and not for Christians. And uh, I'm showing it to you here on the pay on the screen. And I'll put a link to this in the description when you find the post online. OK, I hope this helped everybody make a good uh, get a good p picture now of where Paul stood at the end of 200 A.D., and uh, put in put acts back in its original context that people at that time would have understood and that's why it doesn't impress anybody that's why nobody nobody's impressed by that because it's not actually being circulated to christians and that's another thing about the book of acts it's very well known that nobody refers to it cites it references it until in the late uh, 100s and uh, therefore nobody even knows about it so wh where is it it's in it's in a folder <laughs> it's in a folder called try you know appeal of Paul, we must win folder. That's where it was. And there's another copy at Rome in the folders of uh, Theophilus, the most excellent Theophilus. Okay. Anyway, I hope that helps everybody. God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.